Hi, I'm Mina Marcana, General Director of Spoleto Festival USA. Welcome to More on That Now, our virtual discussion series, which explores themes of the 2022 festival. In a moment, you'll hear from artists and community leaders who will be discussing the role arts have to play in our community. Our moderator, Hussein Rashid, will be joined by Marty Pottinger and Lydia Cotton, two people who uh, actively use their craft to uh, bring the arts into closer conversation with uh, community issues and social issues. Lydia Cotton is co-founder of ArtBot in Hanahan, South Carolina. That's the state's first Hispanic multicultural center focused on arts programming and education for kids and adults. She's also a tireless advocate and community leader for the Hispanic community in the Charleston area. A longtime celebrated playwright, Marty Pottinger, is also founder of Art at Work, a group that works with governments, uh, local and national, uh, and communities um, to bring creativity and the performing and visual arts to address non-arts-based issues. As always, thank you for the discussion. I look forward to a, a spirited discussion. Over to you, Hussein. Uh, thank so you both I. so much for taking the time to, to join us this evening. And I think what would be useful for both us as individuals coming to the arts from, from different uh, perspectives and different lenses, uh, and also for our audience who's listening in on this, is maybe we can start with just some ground setting. Um, and I'd ask, uh, perhaps in the order I, I introduce you, so Lydia, I'll, I'll ask the question to you first, It is how does art form community? Well, I, for us in our community specifically, which I'm being trying to to bring it to the community that reality locally they don't know, right? Our Latino population here, they're not being involved in the arts whatsoever. And many of them, because they come from a place that there's not opportunity, even though it's there. Um, the way that we bring the arts to the community is through everything that you do, we do in the park. Uh, in the streets. One of the examples that I can give is that walking in the park of Hanahan, I noticed that there was no place to sit, even, even though it was a walk area to do exercise. So through mm -hmm. the arts, we construct with our own hands benches, but these benches are designed by the people. You know, they are made by the people, by the community. They are lead by the people. And it's a bench that is going to be there at least 25 years, for sure. Mm -hmm. So we make sure, the, the community itself make sure that, you know, not only uh, create something for the city, for the community, but making sure it's going to be there for a long, long time for everybody to remember. So mm -hmm. I think that identity is the, one of the ways that through the arts, you know, is, is definitely the way to go. If that makes sense. Absolutely. Thank you. And Marty, for you, how does art form a community? I, I, I enjoyed this question, um, Hussein. I, I've always spent time trying to discern and describe the different impacts and aspects of making art, of being creative, and I find that the English language is a poor partner in, uh, in both mm. of those efforts. But uh, I think one of the things that make arts, an art project, an art experience able to form in communities, whether it's very short, whether it's one thing in a mall and it's like a, a you know, people came together and planned something and sang, and everyone stopped and watched, and there's a, that sort of community to actually in-depth long-term arts projects uh, or affiliations. And I would say there's a shared risk that you feel, both as audience and as creators, as artists. Um, I say it's a, it's not a surprise that uh, people are very nervous going to theaters, excited and nervous. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. uh, theater can can be unbearable if it's not going well. Uh, and so that's a risk. And then there's a facing of a fear um, when you're making as an artist, whether it's you alone or you're with in collaboration with others. I think there is a moment where you're kind of facing that 
you know, there's something that doesn't exist that will, it's thrilling. Um, and I think it requires a trust. And this is one of the things, especially for me, working with communities in particular, is it requires a trust of each other that is uh, less and less um, reliable. Uh, it's less called upon in the way things are going in our cultures today. And another thing I like about it is it usually requires one not steer. You know, some people, some people kind of steer where they're going and they're steering where this is and they steer where that is, like steering like in a car. Mm. And there's something about making art and being open to creativity that requires you to actually take your hands off the wheel in a certain way, um, in a different way. And I do think it weakens the ability, and this is what attracted me to start Art at Work, it weakens the ability to think in polarizations. I think it actually mm -hmm. weakens a partisanship. Um, and it, uh, I guess the last thought is just that there is a way that I've watched very defensive people be unable to stay that defensive when they're listening to each other's life stories, when mm. they're engaged in trying to make something together. And it's unlike any other thing I know. It's not like sports. It's not like learning something. It's not like a wonderful dinner or a, a dance party. So that's why I've decided this is, that's why I wanted to stick with it all these years. Great. If I want to, I want to pick up on those last couple of points, Morty, because I think they really dovetail nicely with Lydia's point. And and, and what what I'm thinking of uh, is that we often hear about how art reflects society, but what I'm hearing from both of you is that art can also change society, right? Whether it's about the usage of the park through community art and, and the bench work, or the breaking down of of barriers between people. Uh, as you're speaking about, Marty. And I wonder if I could get both of you to reflect. Um, and Marty, maybe you could just continue this conversation uh, first. Is how does art change or how can art change society? Lydia, do you, do you, should I go through and we'll get out, rid of the slides or do you want to go first? I'm happy either way. Well, I can, I can give an example, right? Hey off to my head, you know, when this mother called me and say, um, Lydia, I have a child, he's 14 years old, he don't want to go to school, he got issues, he got problems, you know. She don't know art, but she said, how can art can help out? And I said, well, I have at least 10 trash cans from our cities that we're going to decorate, we're going to paint, and artistically made them different than what it looked like. And then we're going to put in different part of the city. Will you come along with your child and let's do that to see that that bring you something. At the end of the day, the man was like, this make me think. Mm. I'm thinking. And the child, he was calm. He said, I feel calm just knowing that I'm painting this band so big, or he was little, his bank is really huge. And knowing that that is going to be what is going to be, don't worry, I'm going to take it. So you see, and you can find, you know, remember that that was you who put your hands there. Yeah. So since then, it's been three weeks, we're not finished yet. We, we have, we, we are in the phase three. That's art for me. That's directly mm. to the point when the moms admit that she's thinking, make you think. And the child said, wow, this is different. I feel calm. Now he's going mm -hmm. to school. The last five days, he's been going to school every morning. And thanks to the art, I'm saying like that, it really is, that to me is the best example that I can give. Yeah. That's, That's a wonderful you, Lydia. story, Lydia. It's like a, um, uh, a gyroscope uh, inside the top that mm -hmm. spins the center us, right? Yes. Beautiful. Hussein, do you want me to? Yeah, please, Marty, if, oh, you, okay. if you've got okay. some examples. Uh, so, yeah, of, of um, I, I just will say that I, I came, I, I too had um, been confused in the culture I grew up in here in the United States that art was a uh, um, marginal, that it was a, something that rich mm -hmm. people and fancy people did, that it wasn't for everyone, that it wasn't necessarily... Um, 
a, a core part of being alive. And so I was mostly a, a traditional activist in, 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 in my involvement with uh, justice issues. But then I realized late in life that uh, history proves that uh, abusive rulers well understand the power and that art can actually be more powerful than military action. And then mm -hmm. when uh, when the junta took over in Chile, they uh, targeted Victor Jara and in Argentina, Mercedes Sosa and in South Africa, artist after artist. And not only did the art in South Africa in dancing in particular, but the songs fuel uh, the resistance, fuel the courage and inspire the courage to actually put oneself on the line for change. But it also um, showed me, oh, this is not art is art is essential. Art is powerful. Right. So that led to a major life change for me where I really decided, OK, I, I am an artist. I hadn't been willing to say that up till then. And so I'm, I thought it would be helpful just to show some examples and talk about five quickly, five projects um, in Portland where we really did. We are tackling uh, and attempting to engage in society shaping was your term. So the first one is uh, we were tackling white racism with the Portland, Maine's uh, public works employees. They'd had a, a, a lot of uh, discrimination lawsuits. And uh, this is Dave and Brian. And there's three slides with this project uh, that I just wanted to show. We did prints. Um, uh, it's fine to just show them all one after the other. Um, if you would, the next slide. Thanks. I forgot. Uh, we did carving prints of their actual heritage. So the the intent, the design, and the strategy was to help these white public works workers, mostly working class men, reclaim their actual heritage uh, mm. and not uh, live in the idea that they're white, that that's their heritage somehow. They're Russian, they're Greek, they're Polish, they're French, they're Canadian, right? And so they carved uh, work objects, prints, worked with a wonderful... Uh, African-American artist, Daniel Minter, and carved both images from their job and from their heritage. And then the next slide, please, is they we put them on coffee cups and they got to write a sentence about their heritage and what they loved about their work. And we made prints on them and hung them in the, uh, all over the landfill, the mechanics garage, a budget office, just to have a kind of really multi-year reminder of what they actually, who they really were. Um, and it did make a big difference. The, the next project, uh, I only have one slide I brought from it, but thank you, Leticia. And this was a, a project, it only lasted three days. These are the uh, some of the service workers at Syracuse University. And um, they was very hard to get them to be engaged, but they finally did. And we did a device theater performance. And the chancellor and the board of trustees saw it. And the chancellor changed a decision uh, to build a major building at Syracuse University using non-union labor to being uh, to using union labor. And that's just one example of how powerful this can be when she heard their stories of their lives. Next slide, please. This show is called What It's Like to Be a Man, and I did it as a woman, uh, for having been in the women's movement for years, and I wanted to bring some of the knowledge uh, and impacts of gender identity and sexism and male domination to men in a spirit of love and exploration. And uh, it's a one-woman show, and even today, it was 1987, and even today, men and sometimes women who saw the show way back when will report that it actually comes to mind, and they it is a, a place where they can remember men's goodness. Mm. And that was a long time ago, 1987. And then uh, the last one I wanted to show for us uh, on this kind of idea of how does art shape society. Uh, in 2012, uh, Portland police officers shot and killed David Okada, a South Sudanese man. And there was a tremendous outcry and outrage and demonstrations and rocks and bottles being thrown. Uh, and so the police chief asked, uh, reached out to me and asked if I would write and direct a play um, with officers for th all the three high schools. And obviously the point isn't to, uh, 
the point is to address issues, right? It's not to settle, you know, distract or, you know, change the subject if there's a subject that that's important. So without asking permission, I co-commissioned a group, these group of nine African born uh, high school students to do their own show and work with another uh, theater uh, to do their own show. So both shows, both performances would be at each of the performances with at each of the three high schools in the public library. And these are the officers before one of the performance, before the performances, it was called Forest City Times. This is afterwards the discussions and they were, they lasted forever and they definitely changed people's lives. And um, there were not a lot of, it was tense, it was interesting, it was moving. Um, this is just a glimpse at the smallest high school afterwards of the kind of engagement um, that students and faculty wanted to have, primarily with the officers, but it also shifted the racism directed at the African-born students here is significant. And it also, I learned, the project taught me the power of representation, right? And this is one of the other high schools, just a picture of the audience to give some sense of uh, the changing demographics of Portland, Maine. And then I think there may be one more. Yeah, this is really the only time they all smiled. It was the last performance at the public library. And uh, and one of the things Hussein to mention, there's uh, 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 the man in the middle, uh, Rafiq is from Somalia. He's got the, the cop's hat on, which was, mm. he ended up, in the Somali community here in Portland, Maine, he ended up, he's in high school, was in high school, organizing three meetings between the Somali community leaders, one with the police, one with the state police, and one with, uh, with the Homeland Security and uh, that level, kind of the federal level of enforcement. Yeah. So, wow, that was all out of being a part of this project. That's amazing. Just a, a quick uh, question for clarification, Marty. Were the police officers the same at every performance, or was it new police officers? No, 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 it was the same. <laughs> it was the same ones, yeah. It was okay. the same. They, uh, they were brave in a different way to be in the performance, obviously. They were talking very personally about their lives, and about one got uh, convicted of perjury. One in a, you know, it was just really an intense. Uh, it's on, I think it's on YouTube, but uh, some of these shows are on YouTube. Um, but uh, yeah, people went as deep, you know, that's what theater you can do, right, Lydia? You can just yeah. really, you can go bone deep. And uh, and it required a very different kind of courage. Yes. In reality, theater um, is one of the uh, art forms that you can say so much and, and at the same time um, understand you know, better, especially when it's somebody that is not an actor, like an officer or the community itself. Right. Really, the change comes within so strongly. Yeah, theater is, is the way to go. I love it. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, Lydia, as you're talking about theater, one of the things I'm struck, Marty, looking at your photos of these is that there's no set. That At least in the photos, there's no set. No, there's no set. They're, they're on stage, right? And it feels yeah. like... Um, you know, guerrilla art. I grew up in New York in the in the seventies, eighties, nineties. You know, where where art. You know, it, it it was derided as graffiti, but you know, we call it street art, right? Yeah. And it's it, it's the way in which you look. It's it's what's available to you, which you have access to. And and Lydia, as you're talking about theater, and I'm thinking of, I'm looking at this lack of of set work. Like, just it's something that you can do anybody, anywhere, anyhow. And Lydia, that's really resonating. I think with some of the the projects that you're describing it's you know what is available what is accessible and you know i think that is also resonating marty with something you said is that art is something that is part of our nature it's something we we want to do and we want to create and so it will it will find a way but as you also said marty is that that it's not part art that is is not part of our public discourse in this country as it is in other places it's not institutionalized it's not supported in many ways. And I, and I wonder what the implications are and to both of you again, however you choose to address it, but really thinking about when we cut funding for the arts, are we really choosing to erode our social fabric? Yes. Well, I, I can say this. Um, you're talking to somebody that 
he's not an artist. Somebody that in 2009 uh, find as a grassroots leader, a very stuck of in the communication with the community because of the noise so strong immigration in South Carolina. And there was no way that I could now find a way to calm the community. So when I met this artist, Maribel Acosta, and I explained to her my situation, I said, I cannot communicate. There's something wrong in the community. How can we do this? And she said, through the arts. So Maribel start doing community um, theater with the uh, community, except teaching them how to do acting, doing um, visual arts, and boom, everything explodes. Mm -hmm. Now the channels all are open thanks to the art against. That's what I found art myself. And I fell in love. And I'm in love with theater and visual arts, any type of form of art, because it really helped me to heal myself, seeing how people's lives change every day, knowing a mom that never thought that she could be in a stage acting. She was there remembering the line for one whole hour play mm. that was so impressive for her seeing her family from many countries seeing those parents mom and dad doing an amazing work and you can see on our website all the picture the information when it comes to theater and see in community meetings a police officer painting about an immigrant, an immigrant painting about the police, thinking about them, what the community going, and at the end they have to explain why, or why they paint what they did. One officer paint a duck in the middle of the water, and then he says, I painted duck in the middle of the water because that's how I know Many people see the Hispanic community is a target. Mm. So that was very, you know, powerful and vice versa. The the Latino, you know, write a batch and he explained that it was very difficult for him to see, it, so he had to paint it. So in reality, through the arts, you know, the channels open wide so big for me personally as a community leader. And now I cannot go back. I cannot do anything if it's not through the arts and it changed my life. Mm -hmm. For me, Hussein, Lydia just kind of said it all. And yes, I do think that, you know, you're, 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 you know, I forget if you use the word shredding the social fabric, um, such yeah. a powerful image, but, uh, it's like trying to bowl with your hands tied behind your back uh, to not have engaged the part of, in each of us, uh, the inherent part of our creativity. There's a flexible intelligence that is awoken. There's a, a, an ability to uh, hold contradictions and recognize your own contradictions. Um, a chance, a willingness, a, somehow the courage to take risks, which I mentioned earlier. And um, it awakens, I think, a genuine, uh, authentic hopefulness, uh, which also is in very much in need. And so I think we're, uh, it's very different ground than anything that, at least in the US, which is the where I really need to keep my reference point because this is my experience, but it's a very different ground than political speeches and, you know, parties and gathering and hearings for the city council, you know, to actually have it, have the hearing be grounded in creative expression, whether that would be poetry or, you know, a sketch or whatever. It may sound kooky to the folks listening, but actually it would be transformative and better ideas would come, different ideas, mm -hmm. relationships. People would feel a connection and an mm -hmm. affection for each other that don't hold similar views uh, because that's the kind of ground that creativity uh, lets us walk on. I, yeah. As a grassroots level, I'm sorry, I apologize for this, but as a grassroots level, I can tell you this. If art is cut in any way, shape, or form, it is dangerous. That's the way that we see on the ground. It is dangerous for us because it really 
art make you think like that mother told me right yeah. art make you be creative art really make you do good things art make you help you to communicate if we don't have that it's dangerous for the grassroots movement yeah. the war in reality I, I I love these various threads coming together right now. I mean, there's so many things firing in my head. Lydia, as you're talking about cutting the arts being dangerous, and I'm thinking about Marty's project, uh, the public public works, public voices. Sorry, I, I so, public works. Uh, you know, with public with works. Public works. With public works, right? That's I was like, is it public voices with public works or public yeah, works with right. public works? <laughs> but but with public works. And this challenge to what is whiteness, right? And understanding whiteness is constructed and how do you mm -hmm. unconstruct it. But the flip side of that is brownness is constructed, right? Like how many South Asians are confused for Arabs or uh, Latinx members of Latinx communities, right? Like it's just, if there's a whiteness as a, as a constructed category, there's a brownness as a constructed category. And without the arts, without the, something like the public works to challenge whiteness, you can't challenge brownness. Right. And so without that public conversation, you get massive corporate interests that tell the same stories over and over again, that tell my stories over and over again, that aren't really my stories, that tell stories that are supposed to be me that aren't really me. Right. right. Because we don't have a counter challenge. We don't have the counter art. We don't have the counter narrative. We don't have our own narratives. Right. And I, and I think so for, for me, Lydia, as you're talking about that, that really resonates with some of the examples that that Marty's been offering us uh, as well. And, you know, Lydia, what I'd like, if I may, is to ask you to probe a little bit further as you're talking about this question of being dangerous and thinking about your own work, either as an individual with Marabel and thinking, uh, and, you know, just help me understand or, or ground me a little bit more in the works that you're doing and how, you know, you've given me individual stories of how it's helped members of, of the communities you work with, but sort of at a larger scale, what does art mean for immigrant communities? And, and what are some of the interventions that you're creating with them or that they're creating for themselves that you're facilitating, right? So, so you know, if you run me a little bit there, I'd really appreciate it. To me, art, art definitely is dangerous if it's not there in the middle of everything. And one of the one of the examples that I can give you is that my community based community. I'm talking about Latino citizens that are, are afraid residents that maybe don't have the documentation. Maybe you know they or the children, you know, are citizen, but the other part is not, and they don't have a communication, not even with the African American community locally. Through the arts, we've been able to bridge that gap between both communities. Through mm -hmm. the arts, we've been walking the community cleaning the, 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 the Latinos going to the African-American community for the first time. Mm. Cleaning the community, now that they come to us, we, wanted, we went to them. And then those bands of trash cans that I talked before, that goes to the African-American community from Latinos. So that's what I'm saying, the arts in that sense creating. So it is dangerous that if we don't understand that that communication level, no matter how you put it, it for us locally. I cannot talk about everybody, but you know, when it comes to Latinos, uh, we can come together through the music, we can come together to the through the food, but it's a different come together through a theater. It's a different to go together to a play. It's a different to a visual arts, and it's a different to have a conversation about art. So it. Mm -hmm. it you know that that I go to up to that level. Everything that I think that it can involve a brush, it can involve a play, it can involve an artist, it can involve a city council, an officer, a fire department, the black community, the Asian community, multicultural mindset, all that tied up together. And and to me, that that's a salvation. We have to think on mm. the level, you know, and definitely putting art in it. But I'm not talking about, I'm talking about Mari's work, right? I'm talking about that type of work. I'm not talking about go out there to a festival and have a party and hear the music, eat and dance. I'm talking about the art that it makes you think. And to mm -hmm. me, that is um, definitely uh, the way to go. And I'm not sure if I explained what you asked me, 
uh, Hussein, I but think it's a fantastic uh, job. Yeah. Yes. It is the best way for us in the grassroots level. The community really need, needs to learn a lot of things. I do too. I'm trying to understand meeting Marty now and see her work. To me, is is something new. To me, it's something that I need to now look deeply. And to me, it's like Marty now is my teacher, so I can be more creative through her art. And I think those type of connection and admitting, you know, and taking care of those artists, we locally, mm -hmm. the people, you know, I think it's the best way to, to really have the answer for anything in our communities. Thank you, Lydia. That, mean, that means a lot a lot to me and vice versa. Thank I would you. love to have you as my teacher and Maribel. Um, I I'd wanted to mention that we're in a, a, a first ever situation here in the United States, at least in the kind of arts related funding field, which is mm -hmm. uh, in a increasing number uh, in the, just the last five and 10 years, the National Endowment for the Arts uh, program, Our Town, now uh, includes in their application process the requirement that what they're calling systems change, that the applications and the projects include an evaluation measure, a uh, strategies and goals for systems change uh, and or social impact. And that's unheard of, that's a federal agency. And more yeah. and more uh, funders uh, are doing similar things and calling it different names, but social impact is kind of popular as far as I can tell. That's a first. And um, I think Lydia, the kind of work you and Maribel have been doing, the kind of work I've been doing, the kind of work a lot of our colleagues have been doing for 10, 15, 20 plus years has is influencing. And I say not a second too soon. With, uh, with facing climate uh, destruction uh, to actually put this incredible resource that we each have um, and that we share together uh, to work as uh, quickly and soon as possible. Thank you, Marty. That, I, there's a lot to think about there. What does it mean for art and social impact or structural change and, and how does that work? And, and you know, Lydia, as you're talking about the lack of art as being dangerous, I have to ask, is art itself dangerous? Art is the salvation. <laughs> That's the way that I look at it. Yeah, it's the salvation. <laughs> Everybody else make it dangerous for us when we don't get art. That is that mm. simple. We're in the grassroots level. That's how we see it. It's a salvation for many of us. I just... I've never had this thought before, but Hussein, when he asked that, I thought, is prayer dangerous? Um, mm -hmm. uh, prayer is powerful. Uh, yeah. and, and art is powerful. And does that make it, it dangerous? Is. No, not necessarily no. at all. It yeah. makes it powerful. Not, it makes it powerful. I, I guess, you know, I think, Marty, for me, there's a little bit of that context of how you open about how authoritarian regimes go after yes. artists. Yes. Right? Because yes. art is dangerous for them, right? Again, right. there's a matter of perspective, there's a matter of context, but I, I think there's something in that, that if the lack of art is dangerous, it's because art can also be dangerous. And as we're thinking about social impact, is that a way to neuter, maybe let's not use dangerous, the dynamic and, and earth shattering qualities, the powerful qualities, is, let's use yeah. this language, and the I powerful think qualities of art. And I think danger is like danger is in what context were the were the yeah. songs that carried the civil rights movement and inspired people to the courage and the risk that it needed um, or Maya Lin's Vietnam Memorial. We've probably all seen it or seen photos of it and been there. Is it dangerous? It's powerful. Right. It's very right. powerful. And. Right. Uh, I thought of, I always think of Harry Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, um, you know, where Abraham Lincoln said, here's the, so you're the little lady that started this great big war, which, you know, mm. tens of thousands of people started that great war, right? right? And it had been going on since the beginning of, uh, of European settlement and slavery. But, you know, 
so I, I don't think of it as uh, it's dangerous depending on where, where you are and what your vision is for uh, for us as human community, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we look, we're talking about uh, the clean heart of the people. We're talking about the, the beauty of an artist. What can be dangerous there? I mean, that is, to me, when you, when Jose, when you mentioned uh, the name dangerous to the arts or the question, it was like, a, I received a real shock in my heart, pain, that anybody can think the art is dangerous. Art is pure, just like you mentioned, Mari, just like a prayer, and in reality, you know, I see the change on people in my community. Arts change me. I'm not an artist. I'm somebody who learned in 2009 what is being, what is the arts, you know? And and I see the, the faces of the children learning and going back to school after they were inspired by a community service painting trash yeah. cans and designing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that's powerful right there. So that's art. Yeah, I, I think for me, Lydia, it's that it's that you use that language of beauty, which I have to say, I think is the first time we've spoken about beauty with respect to the arts in this conversation. Uh, and, and I think beauty is is that power. And, and I appreciate you and and Marty elevating the language uh, that I'm using, because I think, you know, beauty is sublime. It allows you to see the world in such radically different ways and, and you can imagine something different. Um, and that to me is, 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 I, I've used the language before, but I think it's earth shattering, right? I mean, every time I look at that piece of art that hits you, it breaks the ground beneath your feet because you're now in a whole different way of understanding the world around yeah. you. Yeah. Um, you're in a new position and I just, I so deeply appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, one, one form of the art that I love too is when I see a Latino, my community, and African American doing something together with their hands artistically, and just by mistake touching each other for the mm. first time, like oh, I'm sorry. But at the end, it's like wow. You know, you you can feel yeah. it and talking about it. So that that sense of art, that oh, you know, art bring them together. That's a reality in my community, and we on purpose, on purpose bring that to the table. Because you had to, in these days, you really had to be that certain of when it comes to how we're going to do this. This is through the arts. So definitely is the best weapon against any war that I can see before. I'm passionate about it because I see the changes. And when you see changes in your communities, it's, it's the most amazing thing you can ever experience to be a grassroots leader, to walk the community, see the suffering of the people and see hope because an art form came out to their life. That's an experience that not everybody has. I do. And, and to reference that the reason why we're here is because of Spoleto who that is mounting this season that is about safety and art and creation with operas and performances, Dale Orlando Smith's performance and major works, but also Spoleto early in the early days was one of the early generators of the kind of art that is in the ballpark of what we're talking about, where they did, you know, on the ground kind of street based engagement, community engagement projects. And that was, you know, quite a while ago. So I, it, it's appropriate that we're here, but uh, you know, uh, nod you. nod to the festival for that as well, yeah. and those folks. Yes, yeah, so, thank you, Marty. Thank so, you, Marty. I, if, if Marty, if I can pick up something you and Lydia both said, uh, you know, you Marty, you talked about safety and, and community safety, and Lydia, you talked about hope. You both have also spoken about engagement with various uh, uh, law enforcement agencies, right, uh, of different characters. And I think you know we're we're obviously at a point in American history where a question of policing and the role of policing and what does that mean for community safety is a very important part of our national conversation. It's a hyper local national conversation, right? Yes, because, uh, because of the, the way law enforcement functions. Uh, 
you, you know, and so I'd love to just hear reflections from the both of you thinking about how arts contribute to community safety. And again, you've both done it implicitly. So, you know, however you want to go with that. Um, but also if you want to maybe offer what you think community safety means, uh, because I think that's something that's sort of in the ether and people don't really have a, a, a cohesive understanding of what it might mean. Lydia, is it okay if I, I actually had fun with this one too? Uh, first question. Yes, Marty. Yes, Marty. I, I never thought about it, right? And so I thought, okay, so what? what? So I thought, okay, say it's three, there's physical safety, there's emotional safety, and then first ever thought spiritual safety. And I thought of physical safety is living with the knowledge that the authorities, and that's whether the authorities are parents, neighbors, teachers, police, or military, they know and respect you, know, value, mm. and respect you. And that the system that enforces laws is actually ethical and that justice is restorative rather than punitive. That to me belongs in the in the cupped hands of physical safety. Emotional safety, uh, that the uniqueness of each of us is valued uh, and encourage not what I call the presentation of normality. I'm a I'm the kind of person that people go, oh, she's a character, you know. And sometimes they say that in, you know, <laughs> appreciation, and sometimes they're making a different kind of comment. But that the uniqueness of each of us is valued, uh, which is a real issue in the U.S. culture for sure, from the, from early on, and that there's a shared commitment. This is the emotional safety, right? To interrupt isolation not solitude, but isolation, um, mm -hmm. and provide support when needed. And then I got to spiritual safety, which again was a first, and that the culture understands that all things are in relationship with each other, that all living things are considered precious and connected to each other. So that's trees and birds in a very deep and essential and disturbingly true way. And that stewardship is an essential element of being human. So wow, that's amazing. I, I love what you just said, Marty. Thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. I can say to me, safety, and I'm going back to always what I do, right? Because I'm talking about my community here locally. And when the Hispanic community will not make a police report for fear, because of fear, that's not safe for me. That I see immediately, mm -hmm. you know. When you've been robbed um, left and right every day for years, and you're not talking about it, that's a problem. That's lack of safety. So my work in back then in 2005, it was okay. It's going to be hard for me to do this, but I'm going to have to unite the grassroots Latino community with the police in order to make sure that they understand that all they have to do is make a report and nobody's going to take you away or take your children away. I have a lot of backlash in that time because people are like, how are you going to do that? Yes. When we did that, the crime went down 47%. And the mm -hmm. community finally was asking, look, that give me more because I've been hurting every day more. After that, we bring the African-American community to help us, to help the Latino, so then they can encounter. To me, that's safety too. It's yeah. not, the, oh, no, just always, you know, the black person was the one that robbed me, except no, 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 no. Not everybody's the same. Now you want to learn how it is. So you sometimes, even though we don't agree, we're going to have to uh, – disagree and we're going to have to bring everybody to the table on a multicultural mindset to bring safety to our community and that works definitely i still receiving phone calls while i was traveling today a lady who just somebody robbed her you know and she's still afraid to go to the police and make that report sure no, mm. so that is a problem that I very embedded about and believe that the communication with the police is extremely important in order to understand why they're, they're there, okay? They're there to give a service to everybody. And that is the way that I approach the safety needs of my community. The, the, thank you. 
um, the this oddly weaves right into, I guess, because Hussein, you came up with these good questions, but this weaves into the other projects that I brought slides to share about, which is about safety and the relationship to the immigrant community and the elected officials. And uh, is it okay? It's called Homeland Security, three I, words. I I was going to be the segue, Marty. So you read my mind. So, oh, so awesome. please run with it. Good. Well, uh, I'm sure you had something smart to say, Hussein. So maybe I'll just take a minute. You want to just pitch any other? No, I, I'm. You know, I'm oh. deeply appreciative because I think both of you have spoken uh, about how your work intersects with law enforcement specifically, and I think hearing from both of you about how you think about community safety just helps gives more depth to that interaction with your mm -hmm. with your uh, respective law enforcement communities. Um, and I think thinking a little bit broader, Marty, I know you've done a lot of work around refugee resettlement. We saw a little bit of that with the kids in high school who you said were all born in Africa. Right. I know there's Somalia, so I'm assuming that they come over as, uh, as refugees from Somalia. Um, we're now obviously dealing with uh, a Ukrainian refugee crisis. We have an Afghan refugee crisis. I mean, we have multiple refugee crises, and I know you've done some work in this area, and I'd just love to hear a little bit about that and about safety right. more broadly. So, Well, this is a, a rather uh, – I was a carpenter for years, and a dovetail is a joint that fits beautifully together um, that doesn't pull apart and needs no glue. This is a, definitely a dovetail moment. Um, this performance and show and project was called, in the end, Homeland Security, three words – and I was commissioned in 2005 to write a play with the community about in response to a dramatic Border Patrol raid in downtown Portland, Maine. Um, and it had a, a huge impact on the uh, documented, undocumented, uh, the, just the entire community, a long time uh, residents and newly arrived. So I wanted to just kind of share this. So I spent one week a year meeting people and interviewing people in Portland. I lived in New York City. Um, Hussein, I lived in the Lower East Side since 75 to 2007. <laughs> so we shared so some of that. you very familiar with street art. Yeah. And, um, and so I got to just, you can imagine, just meet just a, a precious variety of parts of uh, any culture here and system and society. And after a year, we performed to two. Um, hey, if you go back, Letitia, back to the one slide, the first slide, if we performed to sold, sold out standing room only crowds and then had another run the following year. But here we have in the front on the left, um, uh, is a, a Mi'kmaq woman, Heather Augustine, um, who that's one of our indigenous tribes here in Maine for 10, 13,000 years. Uh, next to her is a Chicana uh, uh, Episcopalian priest, Virginia Marie Rincon. Next to her on the right in the turtleneck is Jill Dusan, who is it, 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 during the performance was the mayor of Portland, Maine. Behind her is Billy Wolferton. He was uh, had been homeless for decades. Lives in a tent out by the railroad tracks north of the city. Uh, in the middle is Oliver Albino. He's a um, a South Sudanese refugee. He fought uh, in the guerrilla warfare there. He also went to Oxford University and got a master's in the UK. And then we've got Lucian Matthew, who's a uh, was 83 year old. The 83 year olds at the time. He's a union organizer. He was a butcher for in Maine. They call it the A&P. Very sweet. Uh, mm -hmm. Where I grew up, we called it A&P. So he worked at the A&P. And so this was the cast, the core cast. And then, yes, the next slide, please, Letitia. And then these two young people were high school students from Iran and Somalia. They played radio announcers and uh and would tell sweet weather reports. I really believe humor is an essential uh, part of who we are as humans as well. So they would tell sweet main stories about the moose that stopped the traffic at the toll booth leaving. No one was willing to leave Maine because they drive south because back to New Hampshire, <laughs> there was a moose uh, hanging out at the toll booth or a bunch of bees, you know, that were uh, on the run doing something. So and then the next slide, I'm trying to remember what it is. Um, oh, here they are. And then where the radio announcers are, again, no set, Hussein, right? 
And uh, mm. we had a live band, three uh, Cambodian and uh, and a Bolivian a Taronga player and a Cambodian drummer and a French a Canadian who was the music director, a fiddler. It was just a wonderful show. That is on YouTube called Homeland Security. And we had cameo uh, visits from the president of the NAACP who tells an incredible story about being an 11th generation black Mainer. And so it was, it was mind blowing. Uh, it, it showed who we were in a way no one understood it. Maine is still demographically has the most quote white people in the, of any state in the United States. And this is actually who we are becoming and who we were way back in 2005. So um, the repercussions and impact of this performance, those relationships still continue to this day. It made it possible for me to be hired by the city of Portland for eight years in the city manager's office to start this national initiative called Art at Work um, and do 15 different projects uh, over those eight years with trying to bring diversity uh, to neighborhood associations, uh, just lots of things and some of what you've shared. So uh, that's a glimpse of what is possible. Standing. Thank you, Marty, for, for sharing that. Yeah. Um, you know, I you both have such incredible bodies of work, and I've tried to pick out what I think would be interesting for this conversation. But obviously, it doesn't do either one of you justice for the completeness of what it is, you know, for the totality of what it is you do. Um, so as we start beginning to wrap up, is there anything that I've missed that you'd like to mention now uh, and bring to the fore? Me, personally... I'm okay. I just very appreciative of this time. I, I'm very happy to meet Mari. I had to look and Mari, you're my teacher now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In, in reality, you know, uh, I just want to thank everybody involved, of course, for later, you know, because it elevates, it elevates, you know, the conversation, what we are doing in the community. And, and the more that it happens, the better for us in the community. Again, the arts to me, you know, I'm biased, call me biased, but I'm not an artist. I'm somebody who learned not long ago. And I'm, I'm a follower of anybody who really works through the arts. So I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. And thank you from our community, you know, our grassroots community here, which is great. It has, it needs to see Mari's work. Mari, I'm going to make sure people know about you. Uh, it's important. It's important that everybody, you know, help us to to spread the word and the experience. So thank you. I'm very proud to say, uh, Lydia, I have a Southern heritage going back for uh, white Southern. <laughs> again, we, we're just going to use have to use the word white every now and again just to get uh, get to the next point, right? But uh, yeah, um, and it includes South Carolina and Georgia and Florida and lots of places. So. Um, uh, as well as uh, Northern Yankee heritage. I would like to th say thanks to Hussein. Thanks for the questions. It really was a treat to get to uh, be here and have you have a, um, you are really good at this. You're good at asking the questions, but then also figuring out and keeping track of how to come back to things, where the threads are, where the weave is. And uh, and not at all, you know, the thing that, you know, troubles uh, the culture trouble of trying to, you know, how do you share attention? How do you share focus? How do you do something? How does the conversation itself become collaborative? And I so appreciate that you did that. I really do. Thank um, you, with you in it as well. And I'd love to thank Spoleto. And uh, uh, I already mentioned they've already helped lead the way here uh for the last few decades and um i think the program sounds fantastic really and very much to the point for me homeland security what it became instead of just being about that border patrol raid it was a really in-depth intimate uh look at the impact of 9 11 on portland mm -hmm. maine you know what did this thing that supposedly had almost nothing to do with portland maine so, you know, the minister talked about the 
Ecuadorian boy saying, where's your flag? Where's your flag? And she's like, what? What?" Mm -hmm. He goes, you need a flag. You need to put a flag on to show people so you're safe, you know, and how the mayor stopped putting bumper stickers on her car. Um, and I just the homeless Billy talked about being a first responder, actually, that doesn't isn't seen that way, but they actually do understand mm -hmm. what's going on in ways that a lot of people don't. It was very powerful. And so it's a good, I'm just pleased. I'm pleased to meet you, Lydia, and you, Hussein. And thank you, Leticia, for helping bring us all together. Thank you. So I, with that, let me please extend my thanks to Spoleto for hosting us, Leticia Smith for organizing this, uh, Lydia and Marty for being such amazing panelists and walking us through this process. It has been a true honor and pleasure to be on stage, uh, used loosely with you both uh, this, today. Um, I want to thank you greatly and uh, obviously our audience who's with us right now. So uh, thank you to you as well for giving us your time and your attention. Uh, and with that, have a great day.